Today we're picking up some dog poo. Excellent. Our best day to date has probably been close to the $5,000 mark. Best month, 30,000. Within one year, we hit number one on Google. Year three, we kept on growing, did about 150,000. And now year four, which is what we're in now, we're aiming between 200 and 250. We got a live one over here. Today, we're hanging out with Regan from Ember Mechanical, and we're gonna be talking about some tips, tricks, and hacks on how to elevate your business. I'm hoping that he has some advice for me, and I think I could add something to the conversation for him as well. How does a guy find a quality employee? To find the diamonds, you gotta go through the dirt. I like being outdoors. I like seeing the dogs. Well, it's pretty simple. They poop, we scoop. So what tools are we using? A rake and a bucket, rake and a shovel. I so wish that I could walk around with just those tools. For us, five-star service is just exceeding expectations. If you exceed expectations by a tiny little bit, it blows their mind. Ah, the smell of money. Don't forget to click, like, subscribe, and smash the notification bell. Josh, where are we today and what are we doing? Today we're picking up some dog poo. Excellent. Is this first time customer for you guys? Is this long term? Yeah, this is actually a newer customer of ours and we just thought we'd come check out it's a beautiful property. Okay, and uh, I guess it looks like we got one of the culprits here of the dog poo coming around to say hello. What brought you to poo picking out of all the different businesses? This has got to be one that's yeah. it's not on the top of everyone's mind. So how did you come to this? I was working at another company, I was interviewing a guy and one of his references was a dog poo company. And I was just like, what the heck is this? I'm like, picking up dog poo. And he's like, don't knock it, man. This guy's doing over a million bucks a year. And so I called up the reference guy. I heard you're picking up a million and a half dollars of dog poo. What the heck are you doing? Yeah. And this guy could basically hear him smile over the phone. Yeah. He's like, if I work 45 minutes a day, that's a tough day of work for me. <laughs> And that was it. And we weren't looking at starting a poo company. I had a job at the time, but then COVID hit. And I knew that I was gonna lose my job. And I'm just like, well, what can we do? So I talked to my wife and I was just like, what do you think about starting a poo company? And she's like, I think that could be good. And I knew it was good because she doesn't say I have many good ideas. <laughs> and then I turned to my seven-year-old daughter. I said, what would you name a company picking up dog poo? And she's like, poo pickers. I called my sister. She owned a marketing company. Poopickers.ca was available. And that obviously being a new business, it wasn't gonna be enough to survive. Yeah. So we had to do a lot of other things to make ends meet, but that's how we initially got started. And so what's involved in this process? Well, it's pretty simple. They poop, we scoop. That's about it. So we walk around the property and clean up all the poop and take it with us. And so does your customer leave you like a designated zone or they just say everything that's fenced in, you go for it? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. These guys are the whole property. Some people on acreages have a designated spot where they let their dogs out. Yeah, like a dog run or something. Yeah, most of our customers are residential. Yeah. So it's like, we just clean up their whole yard. Mostly backyards, the occasional front yard. Good job, good job. Okay, Josh, so what tools are we using today? What do we got to work with for picking up poop? Just a little rake, a, little a rake and a bucket, rake and a shovel. We got the dust pens in the back here. It doesn't take much to rake a turd. I so wish that I could walk around with just that, those tools. I have a lot of tools that I have to take with the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To start your business, what's kind of the buy-in cost to equip somebody? Like, do you need a truck, car, van? Like, what kind of vehicle do they need to have? What kind of prerequisite tools do they need? This is basically it. Um, there's a little shovel that we use for the winter time, but this is like, Four bucks, 30 bucks, 20 bucks, and seven, I don't know, 75 bucks total. 75 bucks and you can start picking up poop. Josh provides all the equipment, which is really nice, even our garbage bags. Once we run out of garbage bags, we just go to whatever store, pick up another box or so, and then we can bill it directly back to him. He provides us shovels, rakes, scoops, the Home Depot buckets that we use so that our cars don't get messy. So it's no out of pocket cost. Even like my son, he doesn't drive yet, but I was like, hey dude, get a bike with a wagon. I'll give you the rope by our house. Just drive around with a, with a bike. Kid could do this easy. How was the cleanup today? Find any uh, brown gold nuggets out there? <laughs> sure did, eh? <laughs> yeah. I had a, two full dustpans. I had one. One poo or one dustpan? <laughs> Three quarters of a dustpan. Nice. He's still in training. He's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> It's like this is kind of like the neighborhood kid job just like lawn care used to be but now yeah. lawn care is a huge industry yeah and that's where this is going but i started it with a 300 dollars minivan and this i got into the wrong business clearly i gotta have like thirty thousand dollars in tools before i can even start well i didn't have a choice i was broke yeah i guess so i'm like what can i do with my pocket change <laughs> seeing this it just it just warms my heart that you can start this with 75 bucks i love that 
This isn't a yard, this is a field. <laughs> what is this? this is a big property. <laughs> this is no joke. It's like an Easter egg hunt every day for you guys. This is a big one. This is a much bigger property than we usually do. You need like infrared, you gotta mark those poops. You gotta look for these little bombs getting dropped here. Where are the spots you look for first when you're looking for dog bombs? It actually depends on the dog. Dogs don't have any proclivities towards certain things to poop on? They play in the middle of the yard. Ah, true. And so I think that they poop around the edges. We got, we got a live one over here. Hey Josh, you missed one. There's a live one over by There's the fence here. There's a live here. one. Hey, you better get this one, man. Yeah, we got a live one, we got a real turd. You're right, right along the edges. Right along the edges. Yeah, right there, in all of its glory. Oh, look yeah. at that. Yeah, I get the eagle Boom. eye. Boom. <laughs> you want a job? <laughs> I'll stick to plumbing, I think, for now. <laughs> so Josh, typically, what does a job like this cost a guy? This is, this is a unique one. Any acreage property is a custom pricing, so we kind of see how long it takes. This is a weekly customer as well, which is a different price point. So spring cleanup is a buck a minute, however long it takes. Minimum charge 60 bucks, 60 yeah. bucks an hour. I think this one is around like 45, 50 bucks a week. Okay. So we try to stay around that $1 a minute yeah. range. A residential property ranges from like 11 bucks to like 20 bucks a week, depending on the amount of dogs. So you have a bit of an algorithm you use, like square footage times number of dogs? No, that's too complicated for me. <laughs> I like to say I'm a little dumb, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I think lots of business owners can resonate with that. I think so. I looked at all of the other poo companies yeah. when we were looking to start in this. You do your market research and see what they're doing. No offense to any of them, they just complicated the heck out of this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why are you charging a $5 administration fee? I don't like messing around, so I was just like, well, we're gonna do flat rate for everybody. The theory, whether it's a big yard or a small yard, the profitability will balance out because we're gonna be more profitable on a small yard, less profitable on a big yard, but then I give the customer a phenomenal easy experience. They fill out a request form, I send them a quote within 15 seconds, they approve it, pay a deposit, I can get the booked in, serviced, and invoiced without them seeing a human. All thanks to Jobber. <laughs> For us, five-star service is just exceeding expectations. Meeting expectations is great, that's what they expect, but if you exceed expectations by a tiny little bit, it blows their mind. It's like if there's a little bit of garbage on the property, we'll pick up the garbage, we're not gonna pick up a poo and not pick up like a wrapper that blew into the yard. It's a little bit of extra service that provides the exponential feeling that this company goes above and beyond for you. Totally, and I, I completely relate to that. I provide a service that's called a tankless water heater flush. And so you have to run chemical through their water heater for about 45 minutes. So there's a lot of guys out there for that 45 minutes, you know, they go in the van, they do their paperwork, which is great to do. I prefer to go around to the different bathrooms in the house, I'll pull out their tub drains and pull the hair out of them. And so when you're walking away from the house, they get an additional service they didn't have to pay for. Yeah, that would be like, I would talk about that. Yeah. I'd be like, dude, my plumber like was waiting for his thing to do his thing and then like he cleans out my drains. Yeah, you like, got 45 minutes to kill, you know, so add something to the service that you did that day. Yeah, this is a probably a pretty average sized yard. Like we'd be in and out within 35 minutes. If the dog comes at me, just remember I have to run faster than you, that's it. It depends on the speed of how fast the person goes, the size of the yard, how compressed the routes are, but 30 stops a day is pretty common. But that could be like six to eight hours. We could crush 40 in 10 hours. Because if they're compressed, then you can do a lot more, obviously. So the more we grow, the more compressed the routes we get, the more efficiency we'll have. Ah, the smell of money. <laughs> it's one of the biggest misconceptions of the dog poo industry is that the customers are lazy. They're actually not. Like we have a wide variety of customers from veterans who are amputees to blind people, people with other special needs that need help, people with service dogs. And you know what? Some people just want more time with their family. It's the same concept as lawn care. So it's like, well, why do you get somebody to mow your lawn? It's like, well, I want to save some time. And so when you understand the value of time over the value of money, then you understand that it makes sense to pay for services to get done if you can afford to have those services. Which, if you think about it, if you were bringing in a million or two bucks a year, why wouldn't you pay for things that you could get more time? So you can spend more time in your values rather than picking up dog poo. So this right here is about one day of poo. I absolutely love working for Josh and Poo Pickers. I love meeting the dogs. I love having my own schedule and just being on my own. I'm more of an animal person, so it kind of works out. Typical day, I'm looking at about 30 stops, and it takes me from eight o'clock in the morning till about five at night. You need a dustpan, a rake, 
garbage bags, and a bucket. Oh, and another thing you need is a truck. Don't have a car when you're doing this job. It makes your car stink. How do you manage your customer expectations? Communication, over-communicate. Right from stage one of them submitting a request, the automatic email goes out, starting to set expectations of what's gonna happen. We'll get back to you ASAP with a quote, then we get a quote together, we get it to them, then there's the message that goes along with it. It's just like, this is how long it's probably looking to get you serviced, and it lays out a couple more expectations. We just over-communicate the heck out of everything. If there's no question marks for the customers, they feel secure. That's really what it comes down to. It's just like over-communicating, communicating the expectations, and following through with them, and then exceeding your expectations. What's kind of been your biggest challenges getting into the poo pickup industry? The biggest challenge was probably the first year of making ends meet. The hardest part was getting it off the ground. Once you get it off the ground and the ball starts rolling, now we're talking staffing and we're talking making sure the jobs get done. That's the biggest challenge all the time. Navigating a high volume business where we do up to 100 jobs a day. Navigating the logistics for 100 jobs a day and the staffing. Staffing is probably the biggest challenge. It's hard for a guy like me to relate to that kind of high volume industry. Because, you know, if I do two, three calls a day, that's my whole day. And, you know, you're talking about doing 100. I imagine the logistics of that becomes a lot more difficult. Yeah, we did up to 60 before we got Jobber. Yeah. And that was already falling apart. We were doing extra work for free. We were losing business. Yeah. Um, but then Jobber just kind of streamlined everything. So what's been kind of your most profitable day, month, year? Like, any notable months that stick out to you in terms of profitability? Well, our spring season is, is pretty bonkers, but last spring we had 778 requests come in. That ended up converting around the $50,000 revenue mark. The highest days of revenue are gonna be around springtime, so it's not gonna be like the average, but we've probably done close to a 5K day, which is nice, but that also includes spring cleanups, reoccurring services, um, and people pre-purchasing packages. So part of that 5K could be like $500 to $700 for a year of service. So what's been your best week today then? Probably actually one of the most recent ones. We had done 16 and a half thousand in revenue, but we did about $70,000 in revenue year two. Year three, we did about 150,000, and this year we could do between two and 250. So what kind of margins of profit are you getting? Like, is it different from when you started to where you are now? I don't know what my profit margin was the first year, but once we started getting staff, we had a 45% profit margin. Um, now we're around a 35% profit margin because we realized to keep staff, we need to pay them more. We weren't paying enough, I couldn't pay enough, I couldn't afford it. And so I chose to pay less and just rotate through staff until we get to the point where I could actually hire more people and pay them more money. And then once we hit a certain dollar amount, they stuck. So we're about 35% profit margin now. And you kind of base the business off 35%, but you're trying to get more clients turned through per week so that the end dollar becomes a higher revenue at the end. Yeah, like 35% is a really good profit margin for business. Like I'm pretty happy with the profit margin. I just want to continue growing it. Do you have any really economical or free even marketing strategies that you would recommend to people? So what we did at the beginning, we went on social media, but I joined like 30 different community pages. Now you can't advertise on community pages. So what I did is I started creating a good reputation for my name. I would like people's things, I would compliment people, and I would just create that positive feel when they see my name and make people feel good. Then <laughs> the strategy, because you can't market on those pages, I said, hey, we're considering starting this type of business. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? And then we had 10 people out of those 30 pages. We had 10 people say, I'll sign up if you start your business. And that was before we launched. And so just hit up social media. And like, there's a lot of buy and sell pages that allow business advertisements. And I don't know how effective those are. I just plastered our business all over the internet as much as I could do for free. And then the most profitable marketing that we did, it wasn't free, but it was SEO. If you can find a good SEO person to get you to the top of Google, that's what we did. Fortunate for me, it was my family member, it was my sister, and she secretly paid for it. So I knew they were providing us with our services and they were helping us. I didn't know that she outsourced her SEO. After about eight months, I realized, and I was like, are you paying for this? Yeah. And she's like, well, we just wanted to help you. But that brings up a good point for like early advertising is like a lot of your family and friends are gonna do what they can to help you out when you initially start your business as well. How about yourself? Is there something too big, a yard? Like, you're going to pick the poo on an entire football field? I would do it. <laughs> yeah. I would do it. We had a county reach out to us to do all of their dog parks. Oh, wow. And I was just like, this is a really cool opportunity. I'm like, I will find a way. Entrepreneurs jump off a cliff and they build a plane on the way down. We went from growing two to four new clients a month to 300 clients coming in three weeks. 
that would be business suicide if I turned those away. Yeah. And we quoted all 300, we converted 200, and we made it happen. I hired eight people over the phone. And so I would do the same thing for any job. And so there's no job that we would turn away. And then as you develop your experience and you kind of see, you know, this is what they're expecting, yeah. this is what they would like to pay, and then when your business can kind of make it work in that kind of margin that they set for you, yeah. then that's when you can start doing those jobs. Yeah, and like we're quoting another dog park right now. And there's also a lawn care company that's very large. Everything to maintain your home they do. Yeah. The only thing they don't do is dog poo. And they've been waiting for a company to get big enough to be able to handle their workload. <laughs> I'm like, I will hire an entire team. Yeah. I will hire a whole new team and make an entire schedule just for you. Yeah. And I would do that for any big lawn care company. Yeah. So somebody's just like, I have 500 services a week. For me, I'm just starting out. I'm looking at getting some employees of my own. How does a guy find a quality employee? There was a lady that I talked to that built a $2 million cleaning company in two years. And then I told her that I had a 70% no-show rate for interviews. And she was just like, your, your ads are wrong. You need to tailor your ads to why they should work for you. Josh had an ad on Facebook and I replied to it and we did a little interview over Zoom and then I met up with them and I've been working for Poo Pickers for just over a year. And I realized that I am not in the buying position anymore. I'm in the selling position. I need to sell myself because although there's a lot of selection of people, there's very few selection of great employees. So I needed to tailor their first interaction to why it would benefit them to work for me. Interesting, so that aligns a lot with what I've heard then is that good employees, the best employees are the ones that find you. Josh is very flexible. This is my second job, so on my days off, I can set my own hours. The flexibility is amazing, it really is. To be able to even stop in to let my dogs out is ideal. Josh is a really good boss and Poo Pickers is a great company to work for. With Jobber, it's amazing. The houses that I go to are already set on the app. So in the morning, I can just look at it, do a quick refresher of where I'm going, the number of jobs so that I can have time management. I know how long it takes approximately for X amount of houses. And it's great because it's mapped out. You follow a really good route and the app is super easy to use. It's really user friendly. Not only do you have a job list, you have maps as well. So you can take a look at your route before you even start to be able to visualize it and be able to look at your job list. And then if there's any notes or anything that the clients put in or Josh or team members put in, we have the ability to look at that as well. We also have the ability to take pictures for reference. And if any of the owners tell us stuff that's pertinent for the next time, we can put that in as well. So it's a great app. Finding good employees is tailoring what benefit they would have working for you because they, as a good employee, are far and few between. There's always like a probationary period of about three months or so. How long do you actually take before you know that it's somebody that's gonna stick around for a while? Can you make that assessment after a week, two weeks, or do you usually go to that full three month period? I don't really do a, like a probationary period per se. Like I have them come out for an on the job interview. See where you're gonna go out with our operations manager. She's gonna see if you're a good fit for us and we can assess their mindset from the first day because yeah. we'll send them out by themselves day two because it's not hard. Jobber's really easy to learn. They can go do jobs on their own, even the first day sometimes. So it's like if they follow through with what they say, I see they're accountable. And it probably takes two to three months because you need a little bit of time for their words to align with their actions. But finding good employees, it's, it's an art. I think you treat them with the utmost respect and then you're gonna keep them because you give them lots of grace and you treat them like the valuable human beings they are. Do you also factor in like benefits or anything like that? Or I think because you, got, you have subcontractors that's probably on their own to take care of? It's just an agreed upon wage. I did pay too little initially for a while and that did lead to a higher turnaround, but I just couldn't afford to pay more. But once the business got to the point where I could pay a decent wage and I just kept kind of raising it up and then eventually they stayed, I'm like, that's the wage. It's good enough for them to want to stay. Because if it's not good enough, they'll keep the job just long enough until they find something better. I mean, it's been positive, really positive, and obviously I wouldn't be doing it for over a year if I didn't like it. I like being outdoors. I like seeing the dogs. Every once in a while you get a surprise and you get to interact with the dogs, so yeah. that's cool. I love the dynamic of a business that will overpay their staff. Yeah. Because it makes it so good that they'll never want to leave. But you're really the determining factor. Somebody would probably turn down a job for more money if they knew that you were solid to work for and they could really get along with you. 
Having a lot of flexibility and having a manager that actually cares about the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You're like, hey, I'm hoping to take an extra weekend off here. Is that okay? Yeah, you betcha. Every single job that runs through my business is on me. That's my responsibility to make sure the jobs get done, not theirs. Not theirs. Buck stops with me. Yeah. Right? Crap goes uphill in business. Yeah.